With us today is Judith Glazer. She's written a few great books. The latest one is Conversational Intelligence, How Great Leaders Build Trust and Get Extraordinary Results. This is the book for those of you that are looking on video. And uh, Judith, welcome to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. I'm thrilled to be here today. It's a it's a rainy day in New York City, and it's a warm and cozy day where I'm speaking to you from. So thank goodness. <laughs> That's great. And I'm in New York City, and I actually, we have a little fireplace in our apartment, and I just started a fire. So this is a fireside chat from my perspective. I love perspective. it. I love it. <laughs> so love Judith, it. what is conversational intelligence? Um, the, this is the uh, short version of a long story. It, it turns out that human beings are hardwired to have conversations impact them in such profound and significant ways that it can actually turn genes on and off. So that's a core fascinating challenge for all of us and insight. So yeah, keep well, no, going. It's, it's, it's yeah. great because it's something that you you talk a lot about in the book, obviously. And and this this idea that things we say can create physical and chemical reactions in people, that words literally change our physiology. Yep. And I'm curious for you to talk about that a little bit, maybe give some examples. Okay. So um, this is what it is. Conversational intelligence is hardwired into every human being's cells. It's the way the cells engage with each other. Believe it or not, cells talk to each other. Um, the immune system talks to the cells. There's all sorts of conversations going on inside of us. So that's why when you ask, you know, what happens? Why is there a chemical thing that happens? Absolutely. If I say any word to you, like sit next to me, there's a chemistry inside of my brain and your brain that is figuring out what that means and turning that in, that request into action. And that the brain is designed in a way to enable us to translate these strange interaction codes that people have with each other into something that can manifest a whole company's success. That's so extraordinary. And that's what's going on. And everybody in the world needs to know that in the whole planet. Maybe I just sit and talk to somebody from the co who studies cosmoses. And she said, cosmoses need this. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me that I just spoke to someone from Mars and they needed this. That's right. That's what I should have said. <laughs> but this woman is from Mars, so maybe it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so so to give, me, give us some examples of things that we can say that, I mean, and, and is, it, is it certain words that elicit the same reactions in everybody? Is it different words that elicit reactions in different people? Give us some examples. So the, the backstory behind this question is that I've spent years studying words, uh, linguistics, language, um, the power of words, the power of phrases, all of that on human beings. It's part of my almost obsessive fascination. And it turns out that um, there's some keys that we all need to know about how conversations impact us because they do at a chemical level. There are certain things that if we learned this would totally change our interactions with others. And that's the following. Um, there's certain words that have a feeling of, I love you, I care for you, um, you're in my tribe. We have a big part of our brain called the limbic brain, which measures when we're in or out of a tribe. Instantly, in 0 0.07 seconds, people know that what, based on what a person says. So if I say to you, um, Peter, you sit over there and hey, Sarah, Charlie, and blah, blah, you said over there. And now you're thinking to yourself, I just got excluded from the most important team in this planet. What's going on here? And your brain doesn't stop thinking about and fluffing about and being irritated about the conversation that just happened because now you're excluded. Your limbic brain says, oh, you're not part of the important team. So, so that sounds that sounds more about where you seated me than the specific words you use because you use the same I'm really thinking linguistics but you use the same words to say you sit over here and you sit over there or you sit over there and you sit over there it's the same words but it's where you're positioning people which seems to go beyond the conversation It does go beyond the conversation everything is as a spatial uh, part of the of the word and then there's the actual physical part of the word and it's all relative I I was in a program where I was awarded a, a something or other for this, that um, human beings really think about relativity. That's part of what the brain does. So if my relativity just then was a physical space and I've marked where the teacher wants me to go as the not so important moderate people, and the people on this side are the high flyers, I've gotten a read of the what the environment means that she's putting me in. So those are still things that we translate into words 
but emotional words like, oh, I'm not in the important team. And we start to talk to ourselves by that kind of thing. So it's the words, but also what the physical environment is saying to us in the language of interpreting what's going on. So are there particular words? I mean, is it all context or are there particular words that we don't want to use uh, unless we want to exclude people or we do want to use that represents uh, that they're on our tribe? Yep. So uh, we have a whole study in the conversational intelligence immersion process where we have people that have signed up a thousand people last year. We have 15,000 people interested in this year in our program. And it's because what it does is teaches us how to decipher all of those things that you just said into a syntax of understanding about how leaders need to wake up to be prepared to handle the world that we're moving into, which is a world of constant change where people don't always get to sit in the best seats, but we have to have a better rationale for how we engage with human beings. And we have to help them translate. It's what we call making the invisible visible. What's the story behind what you said is what every human being needs to know to be a great parent, for a teacher to be a great teacher, and for a business partner to be a great business partner. We can't fall back on, oh, I only said it once and it didn't matter, that kind of phrase. That's a not good thing for a leader to hold inside. Because if what that leader did is do that separation and this person now knew that they were not going to be on the popular team, doing it once and then not doing it again isn't enough to erase what just happened. And I want to share with you why. Is that like, is that a burning thing in your heart to figure out why that's the case? <laughs> no, no, no. It's great to understand why. And I want to, and I'm still looking to get the clarity of, because I understand the example. The example makes a lot of sense, which is that if, 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 you're in a, if you feel like you're in an in-group, that's going to do something very different for you physiologically than if you feel like you're in the out-group, right? And we've all felt that. We've all felt in the in-group. We've all felt in the out-group. Completely. And it makes a tremendous amount of sense that part of the job of a leader is to be uh, sensitive and clear and intentional about who they're putting in the in-group or the out-group or whether they're putting anyone in the out-group. It's also the job of us as listeners to be... Um, to, to take ownership, to be accountable for our feelings. And even if we feel we're on the out group, you know, what do I do about that? How do I manage my own emotions around feeling that? Yep. Um, my question is specifically around this thing you've said around the conversational intelligence, the fact that words can shift our physiology. And, I, and I'm still wondering if, if, it's, if it's really specifically words, meaning is there a word that I say that sets off the neuro system in my brain that will make me feel excluded? Or is it more about the idea that if you say things that exclude someone, they're going to feel a certain way? So we have a list that we've created over the last 40 years or 30 years or whatever of what to say and what not to say. Can you share and, some of that with us? Um, yeah, I can pull it up. I have to take a second just to get it off my computer and bring it up here because um, I don't have them all memorized. I mean, we literally have hundreds, if not thousands of them that we've identified. But uh, an example might be... Yeah, just um, an example is fine. Yeah, so, so one thing might be, see, um, um, a leader is very busy. There are a lot of people in the room and somebody says, I wanted to um, pass this over to you for our project. And they said, forget it right now. I have, I'm working with other... It's the same thing. I'm working with other people kind of message. Or um, somebody, the leader says instead, wow, that's awesome. You know, anything that has some sense of you have value that hits a person in their heart as feeling important and valuable. And you can almost say anything once you've done that, once you've activated that part of their body in a relationship with you, that they'll know how to translate, that this is what love looks like from that person. Um, this is the part that's, that's very, I want it's deeper than just that, but I will say that we have say this, don't say this, do this, don't do this. And we give those to the leaders and ask them to circle what are the things that they've done in the last um, 10 days that is on either side where the words are actually explicit and leaders fall off their chairs. I'm, I'm telling you, there are leaders that in meetings will say, oh my God, I don't even live on this other side where I'm showing appreciation in whatever form I need to have. Right. And so, so that's, so, and that makes sense that, that there are certain things we do and that we say, and, and some of them are specific words, but some of them also is the energy that we put out or the way in which we look at someone or the way in which we treat them that shows that they're appreciated or not. And that if they don't feel appreciated, they're not going to feel in the in-group and that's going to negatively impact their motivation and their drive and their engagement and that kind of stuff. Is that, am yep. I understanding this right? Yes. And I'm going to give you an actual case study of where this happened that was profound. And it adds a little bit more 
sizzle to what you said because it's so real and you can see um, a lot of what I'm talking about. Um, a leader, I was called in to um, interview a leader, a CEO who was being considered, actually a um, senior vice president or an executive vice president who was um, considered to become the CEO of a very large global organization in publishing. And the reason why he hadn't automatically been given that position is they got feedback from his direct reports that, that, that he didn't like them that he didn't value them as much as they thought they should be valued. And so I interviewed him about, um, I interviewed them first to find out that walking down the hall every morning, they saw him and he saw them and he looked up and he would often give curmudgeoning faces or like weird faces to these people who were his direct reports. They came away feeling that he didn't value them. And um, that when they were interviewed by the uh, board, that's what they said. We're not sure we have a good relationship with him. We can't tell because these signals are being sent around in our interactions. And we literally are scared and frightened to direct, be direct reports of his if he becomes the CEO. And it turned out to be what you were talking about. He was walking down the hall, did not realize that when he was thinking he was a high introvert, he was planning his day. And when he picked up his eyes, he passed the people in his office. But he had a thought in his head about what he was thinking about. So they got the backslide of that thought, whatever it was. And he had no idea he was doing this. And I, when I coached him on it, all of a sudden he said, I'm going to do your, your, you want me to be an experimenter? I'm an experimenter. I'm going to walk down the hall and I'm just going to connect with everybody. And I said, brilliant. And he did it. And we interviewed the people again and they say, what did you give my boss to drink? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's actually interesting. I, I was coaching somebody once with a very similar situation where it was nine in the morning and she was a very senior person in a bank and she would pass people and she wouldn't say good morning to them. And they would complain that they didn't say good morning. And I had a conversation with her about it. And she thought it never occurred to me to say good morning to them because I've been in the office since six in the morning. So by the time they're getting in the office at nine, it's not morning for me anymore. Yeah. I'm not thinking <laughs> about starting my day. I'm just thinking that like this is the middle of my day. Yeah. And, and it just doesn't occur to me to say that. And also when, when she shifted, that made a big difference for her. That's great. Yeah. Those are great examples. Um, it, it seems like as I read the book and as I'm listening to you, a big piece of this is as simple and as profound as seeing the world from another person's perspective. Meaning rather than just go through the world in your perspective, to pause long enough to say, how am I being heard? How am I being seen? How is what I'm saying landing on other people? And understanding and being curious enough to understand what the other person is experiencing to be thoughtful about what you say and what you do so that it has the intended impact. Am I thinking about this correctly? You are. And there, it's actually something that we call developing the third eye in others, which the eye is that um, people have intention when they're interacting and often don't realize that there's an impact for everything that they do. Mm -hmm. The littlest thing from scratching their head back here, this is universally, I don't understand what you said. That's what this scratch behind the ear means. And if we know that, it's a whole other level. I could go back and say, oh, let me do this again because I'm seeing that it's not fully registering. Or this up the nose thing when somebody's uh, upped somebody and you know done better in a conversation. You know, we have all these things that are going on. We should be teaching these things to people. Is right. what I'm saying. You know, we should get people down into that level where they realize that the impact of everything that they do makes a difference, and it can last for years and months. I, you know, and it, and, and what's big. it yeah. is it's huge. And what's interesting is that it's it's deeply embedded in our psychology. So if I name drop right? And it has an impact on you that says, oh, this guy thinks he's full of himself. Maybe I don't realize it, but I'm. But there's a reason I'm name dropping. I'm name dropping because I might feel insecure or I want to show that I'm really great or I want to... So I'm doing it out of this deep psychological need or an insecurity or the reason I make a conversational move or the reason I make any kind of move in a relationship is because I'm hoping that it'll do something for me. Right. And, and, and oftentimes it has the opposite impact. And you, you, you know, as I read the book, you um, said something or alluded to something that I found very, very interesting, which is that ultimately the measure of the success of a conversation is whether it builds trust or how much it builds trust. And I think it's really interesting and useful to bring something to its basic simplicity, which is anytime I open my mouth, I should assess what I'm about to say by the question, am I building trust or am I diluting trust? 
Again, mm-hmm. am I thinking about this right? And do you have examples or you want to share any anything around that? Um, I want to share that I had um, many years in a and still do in a great relationship with Angela Arnst, who's now over at Apple. She's heading up global retail. She was the CEO of Burberry. And um, I worked with her for such a length of time. I could see how she took this concept of trust and cascaded it throughout everything that she did. Um, and one of the things that I saw her do at uh, Burberry was that every person she screened for a job, they had to go through the trust test. Do they understand what trust even means? Do they consider it in their life? Give me an example of when you had trust and didn't have trust and how do you handle it? If people didn't pass that part of the test, they didn't get into Burberry because she wanted a team. And I can tell you, it was extraordinary to be with her team in New York, be with her team in London and have them all have a conversation that they were having with her regardless of where they were in the world, because they loved working with her because she brought them to the height of their best behaviors, including trust, which is the most important thing here. And people then felt like they were all having a conversation with Angela, and they were. And that's how Burberry, one of the reasons why Burberry did so well. She created that cozy environment that encompassed the globe, because that's where her people were working, right? But still enabling them to feel like they had one conversation. So trust is the most important thing because when trust is low, the part of our brain down here, the amygdala, gets really fired off. It's part of the limbic brain, which is the brain that measures, am I in or out? And then it's part of the lower brain, the primitive brain, which says, the only thing I can do is fight, flight, freeze, or appease when I'm in distrust. That part of the brain is in surveillance all the time and in 0.07 seconds knows what's going on between us on trust. What we're trying to do in conversational intelligence is not only define that trust um, continuum for people, not only helping them notice, which is so important, what's happening in them and others when distrust lives, but also how to bring people in trust like Angela is doing with each other. Because when they do, what happens, this part of our brain, prefrontal cortex, is loaded with wisdom, integrity, strategy, insights, empathy, um, foresight. It's beautiful. It's so designed for that. And often it's turned off because people don't have trust with each other. So they access what they know, which is up here, the neocortex. And then people argue about whose neocortex is smarter than the others. And we end up in very positional things in in companies that are going through transformation and change that set them back. So I put it all together in a story, but that's how my mind is, you know, capitulates it. I hope it's clear. (laughs) No, it's great. And what I'm curious about is, does it work the same way for ourselves? Meaning if I want to build trust in myself, can I say certain things or relate to myself in a certain way, the same way I would build trust in me from other people, meaning I would build trust in other people. Mm-hmm. Can I build trust in myself? And a good, I want to sub question is, is it, tr- you, you're building trust in yourself, but is it for yourself? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. To like know that, that so I, that I trust myself more. Are there things that I can yeah. do so that I trust my my trustworthiness so that I trust my capability to achieve something so that I trust my, uh, my willingness to stand up and speak and say something that's important. You know, the same way I want other people to trust me to stand up and say something that's important. I want to trust myself that that precedes it. Can we, and there's a lot of people who are sort of frozen in that area who, whose greatest issue isn't, I mean, I could get you to trust me, but maybe I have a hard time trusting myself. And so that I don't take bold action, which would, which would be useful for myself, for the organization. Can we uh, build that in ourselves by how we speak to ourselves? It's 100% important, maybe 1,000% important to have a dialogue with yourself going all the time. I was just thinking about that today. It's funny you should ask that. I'm walking around this office and I'm thinking, okay, who's the relationship? Is there any that I need to work on? Okay, and how am I going to work on it? And then there's another question I always ask is, um, are people going to think I'm I'm saying that I can over deliver or are people saying I can deliver? Because if I promise something and I don't deliver, then I'm going to be out of sync with others. But how do I deal with my own ego? Because my own ego might want to say, yes, I can run a triathlon the first time I'm out on the race. I don't need training. That's an ego talking to you, beckoning you to do more. But it's not the voice that you need to have in order to solidify the trust relationship. You have to be really transparent with yourself and say, what can I do now? What can I really do? And how do I bring that into the world in a way that doesn't cause people to come back and say, hey, you failed again. You said you could do this. And that was your ego talking. Am I supposed to excuse you? <laughs> you know, in other words, those self-talk, thing, we have to constantly be auditing. Is our voice inside our best friend? And if it's not, you got to make it your best friend. So 
Judith, <laughs> thank you so much. The, the book is Conversational Intelligence, How Great Leaders Build Trust and Get Extraordinary Results. Judith Glazer, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. I'm thrilled to be on. And uh, if people want to have any more materials that go with the book, um, our site, conversationalintelligence.com, if they go to it, there's some um, interviews with Fran Tarkington and me. I was there for a day, he invited me up so people could listen to him and, and to me and a couple of other Alan um, Stellman, I think is his last name. I have to go back and look now, but a number of videos and handouts and things like that. And I, this is a book that you could use with people in your organization every week if you want to do a book club or every month. And there's a lot of great stuff there. So thank you for letting me be on and sharing my enthusiasm and you're in share, uh, sharing yours with me. I love it. So yeah, thank it's you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay.